Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we'll get get going um, with our seminar series today. Uh, my name is Andrew Paul. Uh, I'm a senior science advisor with the Office of the Chief Scientist and am the host for uh, this winter's um, uh, Office of the Chief Scientist uh, uh, science seminars. Um, before starting today, I would just like to res respectfully acknowledge uh, that many of us are on the traditional lands and gathering place for treaties 4, 6, 7, 8, and 10, as well as the homeland of the Métis uh, peoples. This includes the traditional territory of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, and Soto nations. I encourage everyone, wherever they may find themselves today, um, to please recognize and acknowledge the relationship that First Nations, Inui, and Métis have with the land upon which we live, work, and learn. Uh, as you will probably have noticed, we are recording today's seminars. Uh, <clears throat> these recordings are posted on Alberta Environment and Protected Areas YouTube page. So if a colleague of yours misses today's presentation or you want to go back and review it, um, please go to that, that site um, where you'll, you will see these, these presentations being posted. Uh, finally, just to maintain our call quality today, you'll notice your camera and mic have been disabled. Um, please enter any questions you have um, today uh, in the chat box. Feel free to enter those questions at any point during the, uh, the presentation, but I will uh, wait until the end of today's presentation before reading those questions out, out loud um, uh, and in the order that they were received. Uh, so for today, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Barry Robinson with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Uh, he will be presenting on species dens density models to inform conservation of grassland birds throughout the Great Plains. Uh, Dr. Robinson completed his Bachelor of Natural Resource Science at the Thompson River University uh, in 2005, and then his MSc and PhD at the University of Alberta in 2009 and 2015, respectful, uh, respectively. He's been pr practicing wildlife biology for 20 years, working with various species ranging from uh, red squirrels, elk, wolves, northern go goshawks, and um, arctic peregrine falcons. Since 2016, Dr. Robinson has been a land bird biologist with the environmental, uh, with Environment Climate Change Canada, where he specialize, is, specializes in prairie grassland birds. Uh, and I think we're sharing your screen, Dr. Robinson. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. And um, yeah, thanks to the Office of the Chief uh, Scientist here in Alberta for inviting me to give this talk today. And uh, thanks to all of you for tuning in to, to listen. So the Central Great Plains of North America are um, a largely uh, unforested, relatively flat uh, region within the central part of the continent, as you can see in the figure here on the left. Uh, the shaded area. Uh, it extends from north to south from roughly Edmonton, Alberta, uh, up here in the northwest corner down to central Mexico, and from west to east from uh, the Rocky Mountains over to the Appalachian Plateau uh, and east of the Great Lakes. Um, uh, now, be because this region is, is uh, also very, the climate, soils, and, and um, topography of this region make it ideal for growing food to feed our, our population. Um, and as a result, uh, this area has, has ex experienced a massive change in land cover uh, since European colonization. Um, and that's what this figure is trying to show. So the, um, again, the shaded areas, the Central Great Plains, what you're seeing in purple there are the grasslands uh, within the Central Great Plains that have been lost since European colonization, primarily due to cropland conversion. So plowing it up and, and starting to grow row crops, but also, uh, especially uh, particularly in the south, woody encroachment is another major threat that has led to, to these losses. So that's the purple area. And if you add the numbers up, we've lost about 60% of our grasslands within the Central Great Plains in North America. If you compare that to say the Amazon rainforest, I think the, the latest figure is about 20% of that the Amazon rainforest has been deforested. Um, so this is a, a staggering number that, that um, is becoming more wide, more, more commonly uh, known throughout the public with, with over the last five or 10 years as, as people are trying to focus attentions on grasslands. Um, if you zoom into Canada, we the numbers are even worse. We've lost about 75 to 80 percent of our grasslands in Prairie Canada, depending on which figure you, you look at. Uh, in Alberta, we're sitting at about 75 percent loss. Um, and uh, 
The other part of the figure I'd like to point your attention here is the yellow and the green. Those are still uh, grasslands that remain, um, but this is from various analyses that have been done are, are highlighting in yellow what we consider vulnerable grasslands. So those are at, at high risk of loss in the near future, either to cropland conversion or shrub encroachment. And the green areas, which are further to the west, um, are the what we call core grasslands that have a lower risk of being lost. So as you'd expect with, with numbers this great in terms of, of loss, um, the animals that inhabit these grasslands have also experienced uh, drastic declines. And I'm going to particularly focus on grassland birds uh, for today's presentation. So these three figures are kind of just from three different sources, all showing the same thing. Um, on the left is from the most recent state of the birds in the USA report. This is showing grassland bird species uh, since, since we've started monitoring, monitoring them en masse in 1970. Uh, the, the Americans have lost between sort of 30 and 60 percent of grassland bird populations since then. The central uh, picture here is from the state of Canada's birds report from 2019. And uh, same, you know, same sort of data source. Um, we've lost about uh, 57 percent of our prairie grassland birds since 1970. And then this figure on the right is a recent uh, science paper by Rosenberg et al. Um, and that has used data from both Canada and the U.S try and quantify uh, loss rates of, of various bird groups depending on which uh, habitat type they occupy. And as you can see, grasslands are the, the winner, or in this case, the loser, I guess. Um, they've experienced the most severe declines of any other bird group at about 50%. And if you look at the proportion of species that are in decline for grassland birds, it's sitting at about 75%. So not only is there a massive loss in total numbers, uh, there's a large proportion of those species are, are, are experiencing steep declines, which is not unexpected. Uh, given the, the drastic change in, in amount of grassland we've experienced. So as a result of this, you know, you know, really continental scale conservation issue, there's been um, a number of tri-national continental conservation initiatives that have popped up over the last, say, I don't know, 10 years, uh, particularly in the last five years, things have really ramped up. And here's three examples of those. Uh, Commission for Environmental Cooperation is a, it's an agreement between the three major wildlife organizations in Canada, the U.S. and Mexico, which work on not just grasslands, they work on every every conservation issue, but the grasslands has been a major focus over the last while for them. Um, the Central Grasslands Roadmap Initiative is was spearheaded by a, an NGO based out of Colorado called the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. Um, and that's an attempt to um, you know, get together various stakeholders from, up for, th from all three countries um, throughout the Central Great Plains to try and uh, work collaboratively to come up with like a roadmap to success to try and conserve grassland or stop the loss of grasslands at a continental scale, while also trying to you know, um, improve the socioeconomic status of, of you know, humans who rely on grasslands for their livelihood, primarily ranchers and farmers. Uh, and then there's the JV8 Central Grasslands Conservation Initiative. This was um, it's, it's um, an agreement between the eight migratory bird joint ventures that span the Central Great Plains. Um, and, and each of those migratory bird joint ventures does a lot of really good on the ground conservation work and has been for a long time um, for grasslands and, and other habitat types as well. Um, but the JVA uh, conservation initiative is really an agreement between those eight organizations to work collaboratively in a way that will, um, you know, conserve or meet, set, set and meet conservation objectives at a continental scale, not just in their own group, but, but working together to make it a continental effort. So as these continent scale conservation efforts um, ramp up, there's been this increasing demand to use science to help uh, inform conservation action to ensure that we're you know, allocating our conservation resources in, in the most efficient way possible. And just as an example, I, I just put this map up here. This is um, zoomed up in Canada. This is the Canada-US border at the bottom here. Uh, this is the Alberta-Saskatchewan border and then Saskatchewan-Manitoba border. And the different colors represent the various land cover types that are present uh, right now. And just focusing in on this brownie orange color, that's the remaining uh, grasslands in Prairie Canada. So if you were to strategize, you know, conservation efforts, you'd ask, you know, which of those grasslands, you'd have a bunch of questions you need to add, answer in order to de determine like where you should focus your efforts first, because we don't have enough resources to conserve everything. So we need to, to use science to help inform how that conservation strategies are developed. And here's the, a list of four questions I put together that you often have people asking uh, in order to inform conservation action. So what is the population size of a species of interest uh, in various jurisdictions? So, for example, if you have a species, you know, what proportion of the Canadian population is in Alberta versus Saskatchewan or Manitoba? Or, you know, what proportion of, a, of what proportion of the North American population is in Canada versus the U.S.? These are questions we often ask 
during species status assessments, when we're trying to determine, um, you know, the conservation status or determine whether species are critically endangered or threatened or, or, or any other conservation status. Uh, another question is, uh, where are the highest priority areas for a given species or group of species? Which, which areas do they need the most in order to, to maximize growth of their populations? Um, how much habitat do we need to conserve in order to meet population objectives? You know, for these uh, endangered and threatened species, we're, we're always writing recovery strategies, uh, either federally or provincially, and, and setting spe very specific population objectives. But, you know, what do we need to do across the landscape? How much habitat do we need to conserve or, or stop the loss of in order to meet those population objectives? And also, which, which habitat should we conserve first? Like I said, we, we can't conserve everything. Um, so, so how do we decide which which places to focus our efforts on initially? So, if you think about it, a lot of these questions, or all these questions, I guess, can in, at least in a way be answered by having a better understanding of the spatial variation in the abundance of the species you're interested in, and that's where these species density models come in. And uh, you know, the problem is it's very difficult to create a meaningful sort of uh, accurate model at such a broad continental scale. Uh, but luckily, uh, the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, which is uh, an effort based at the U of A here in Edmonton, has come up with a really innovative way to build these large scale density models uh, across vast, massive, massive areas. And um, I don't want to go into the details today, because uh, but there's a couple of citations at the bottom there and people are, are welcome to ask questions at the end or, or reach out by email if they have more, more questions or visit the Boreal Avian Modeling Project website, which has tons of details there. Um, but in a nutshell, what this this innovative statistical technique does it allows us to combine dif disparate data sets. So survey data sets that, that count how many birds are present across the landscape. You know, sometimes you have five minute point counts, 10 minute point counts. You know, you, you have different survey areas that you're counting at. This, this uh, accounts for those differences in protocol and allows you to combine those disparate data sets into one set of analysis. Uh, it also accounts for imperfect detection. Um, and, and as a result, allows us to model true density as opposed to relative abundance, which has a lot of benefits that I'll outline in a minute here. And, uh, and then we use a, what's called a boosted regression tree model, which is a, a machine learning implementation of artificial intelligence um, to build these uh, what we call pixel based species density models. And this isn't like, you know, your fancy chat GPT uh, AI. This is much more basic than that. You can run these analyses on, a, on an individual, you know, fairly fancy desktop computer, but you don't need like a supercomputer or anything to run them. Um, so looking, uh, you know, once this demand for the science need came up and, and the, the, really this need for having these big, large scale density models for grassland birds came up, it, I looked to the Boreal Avian Modeling Project to find those, um, to find out a strategy to make these models. And when I start, first started doing this back then, I think it was 2017, 2018, uh, I was really just focused on Canada initially. So this map again is just showing Canada US border here at the bottom and Alberta Saskatchewan border. Uh, Saskatchewan Manitoba border and this is sort of a buffer around this blue polygon is a buffer around the center Great Plains and at first I was just looking to Canada so I was trying to find all of the bird point count data I could find within Canada and through a lot of different efforts and, and through partners I was able to get my hands on um, 70,000 unique survey events across 25,000 unique locations which is shown here in black the data sources are from provincial breeding bird atlases you know individual grad student projects uh, provincial, federal government, biologists, um, North American Breeding Bird Survey. There's a whole bunch of different data sets that go into here. Um, so that's how I initially started this and started building models just for Canada. But the thing is, if you look at a lot of these um, grassland bird species that, that breed in the Northern Great Plains, this is just showing, if you look at their breeding range, this is an example of what one looks like for a chestnut colored long spur. If you look at the breeding range here in, in this uh, like beigey red color, it's often cut right in half by the uh, 49th parallel, the border, the Canada US border. And you see this over and over again for many of these grassland bird species. And so it really doesn't make a lot of sense when you're putting all this effort to build these models to just have this artificial, you know, cut in your, your model. And so um, I really uh, put a lot of effort into reaching out to collaborators throughout the continent to try and um, make efforts to make a, a truly continent wide. Uh, density models for as many species as possible. And in the end, I it's, uh, ended up forming this collaboration between Canadian Wildlife Service, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies, which is that NGO I mentioned based out of Calgary, and World Wildlife Fund to try and get as much data as we can. And uh, not only just the, the bird count data, but also the spatial covariates that you need to make your predictions with, and all, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and through that effort, I was able to get these black 
points here represent the point count locations, uh, 230,000 sampling events from 74,000 unique locations. Um, and uh, so, so a large amount of data that which is needed to do something at a continental scale like this, which couldn't be done without, without um, those uh, really good collaborations from multiple entities. Um, once I had those data, the next step is to, to make predictions, build your model based on spatial covariates. And again, I'm not gonna get into the, the nitty gritty here, um, with boosted regression tree models, it's not a parametric model. So because it's machine learning, you can really throw in as many covariates as you want. You can have, um, doesn't matter if they're autocorrelated or, or if there's correlation between your variables, you can have the same variable at, at different scales. And it really, the machine learning just figures out which complex set of interactions in those covariates is, is most, uh, gives you the most accurate prediction of, of your account data. And I think in total, I had 62 covariates that went into this model. The only disadvantage of having more variables is it makes the processing time slower. So, um, but that's the, the, the four main categories that our covariates fell into are land cover. So things like the amount of grassland, shrubland, wetland, forest, um, various weather covariates. I think I had eight weather covariates, things like um, growing degree days and mean summer precipitation. Um, uh, thing, you know, all sorts of different things like that. And I usually have lag effects too. So whether from the current year that um, point counts are collected and also um, from the year prior to the point count being collected to try and get at lag effects. Uh, topography, things like terrain ruggedness and, um, and topographic wetness index, things like that. Um, and then NDVI, which is a measure of photosynthetic activity to help quantify variation in biomass within those land cover categories that I mentioned before. <clears throat> So again, not going into the modeling details, but once you have the point count data and, and all your covariates, then you can use the machine learning to create these uh, large scale density models. And here's an example of what one looks like for a grasshopper sparrow. I picked that species because it's fairly wide ranging and actually, right, you know, you see these all the way up. There's different subspecies that occur, you know, in California and down in Florida and stuff, but this is the central Great Plains population of grasshopper sparrow. And as you can see here, I'm predicting true density in individuals per kilometer squared. Uh, the yellow being the lightest, the lowest density, and red being the highest density. So that's just an example of what these, um, what a, a density model looks like for from this process. So once you do this, once you start creating these models, then you can start answering some of the questions that I talked about before. And I'll just run through various examples here. So the first one is estimating population size. So again, because these are true density uh, models, we can. It's really easy to use them to to estimate population size. You just you know, multiply your density estimate for each pixel by pixel area, and then sum those up across whatever polygon or jurisdiction you're interested in, whether it be Alberta or Canada, or and you can come up with a population estimate. And one sort of you know real world application of, of my models is um, right now the Birds Canada and um, uh, is putting is participating in an effort to try and define key biodiversity areas within Canada. And they do that by seeing whether certain areas meet various IUCN thresholds to classify as a key biodiversity area. And one of them is a, is a species category where if any one uh, you know, threatened or endangered species, if, if any one area makes up a certain percentage of the population of that species, um, then we can designate it as a key biodiversity area. And so this here, this is showing my model, my density model for chestnut colored longspur. Again, this is the Canada-US border here and uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. Um, and then these polygons represent important bird areas that we've already known about for a long time. But um, Birds Canada was asking for help to see if, you know, we had data to, to see whether any species would cross these IUCN thresholds that we, so we could designate these IBAs, important bird areas, as a key biodiversity area. And it's a very simple process to do with, with these density models. So you can just add up the density estimate within each of these polygons. Um, compare that to the whole population estimate for Canada, and you can see if, if um, and I, I believe they were able to use this analysis to, to designate at least a few of these IBAs as key biodiversity areas. So that's one application. Uh, a second one, I think this is one of the more interesting ones, is to set habitat objectives. So like I said before, we're constantly setting population objectives, but you can't really, you know, unless you're talking about a harvested species, you can't really do much uh, to to meet those objectives with, other than manipulating the habitat, right? And so, like I said before, the species density models can be used to estimate population size. And because um, habitat or land cover is one of the key variables in these models, we now have this link between the amount of habitat across the landscape and population size. And this, here's just a graph showing what that hypothetical relationship would look like for a grassland bird. And so then what we can do, once we have this link now, is we can simulate grassland loss 
or grassland conversion to cropland in this case, because that's the major threat we're dealing with. And, you know, so this again, we're just showing the distribution of the different habitat types um, in the prairie Canada here, the brown being the grasslands. And so what I can do is simulate those grasslands, convert them to cropland, which is shown in beige, re-extrapolate my model and see what the resulting population decline was um, on the species. And, it, uh, and it, I'll show you an example to, to make this easier to demonstrate. But um, to make this simulation more realistic, um, I used this existing model of, of grassland conversion risk, which was produced by Sarah Olam from the World Wildlife Fund and I, and published in Ecological Indicators. Um, so this predicts the, the conversion risk. So this, this uh, yellow to red color here in the grasslands is showing the, the risk of conversion from low and yellow to high and red. Um, and to make my simulations more realistic, when I did, a, I did a random sample of grassland pixels, but it was weighted by conversion risk. So those risky pixels had a higher chance of being converted to my simulation. Now I'll just walk you through an example here. With, this is for Sprague's pipit. And so on the left, this is showing the distribution of grasslands. Um, in, in the area. And so the darker color is grasslands and the, the lighter color just all, are ha all other habitat types. And then on the right here, this is the, the density model for Sprague's pipit. You also see the hectares of grassland on the left and the numbers there and the, the population estimate for grassland uh, birds. It says males there, that should be right. That's total population size. We're gonna have to change that. What I'm gonna do is just, uh, you see year zero here and you'll see it skipping two years at a time. And, and I'll just show you what this simulation looks like. So as you go through, you can see on the left, the grasslands are declining in extent and the hectares are declining and the resulting population estimates also going down. So that's what it looks like after 10 years. I'll just do that one more time for people to see. And now here I'm demonstrating, I think this is an 8% per year loss rate per ground, which is really high. Um, just to, I just use that to demonstrate what the, what the simulations look like. But what you can do is you can run those simulations um, with various grassland loss rates. So that's what's shown here on the x-axis, the percent grassland loss rate per year ranging from zero to four percent. And then on the y-axis, this is what my models predict the resulting annual population decline will be uh, over a 15-year period, in this case, um, for Sprague's pipit. So now if we have a population objective, say for Sprague's pipit, say we want to reduce the decline. I think it's at about it's be declining at about five percent per year right now in in Canada, and say we want to reduce that to to minus 0.85 percent per year. Well, from this simulation, we know that if we can't lose grasslands any more than 0.54 percent per year, if we will have any hope of meeting that population objective, and I think we're right, we're probably losing them about one percent per year right now in in Canada, depending on which figures you look at. Um, so that's one way you can actually set habitat objectives or get this link between you know, current loss rates, this threshold loss rate, and, and how you can meet your population objective. Now, one important caveat is uh, that this is assuming that the only driver of population decline is grassland loss on the breeding grounds, which is obviously a, an invalid assumption, but it's, you know, it's still a first step in the right direction. Um, you know, there's still loss in Mexico and southern U.S. on the winter range that's probably contributing to population decline. You have climate change, you have widespread insect collapse, pesticide use. So all sorts of things could be contributing to, to population decline, but just considering grassland loss in the breeding range, this is um, this is a, a way that we can work toward figuring out how many acres of grass we need to conserve. So if we're losing 1% per year, we can't, we can't afford to lose any more than 0.54% per year. That means we have to conserve or stop the loss of grasslands at a rate of 0.46% uh, per year. So, you know, that's one way of setting acre object or sorry, area objectives for habitat type. Um, the next, you know, question to ask is, okay, well, which habitat specifically do we want to target? We know we need to have an area. We need to conserve this proportion of the grasslands per year. Which particular grasslands, which spatially explicit grasslands do we want to actually target? And to do this, we can identify priority areas for a given species. And you could do that for an individual species just by looking. So here's three species, um, Sprague's pipit on the left, chestnut colored longspur in the center, and Baird's sparrow on the right. There's three um, grassland bird species of conservation concern here in Canada. If you look at the red areas, those are probably the highest priority areas for that given species. But you can use this zonation spatial prioritization software to combine models across you know, any number of species that you're interested in to look at you know, uh, priority areas for different groups of birds or guilds of birds. And there's all sorts of different parameters you can put into the software. You can, so for example, what I've done, I often do is weight by species conservation concern score. So if you have 20 different species, you want, you want to throw into the software, 
and say five of them are you know critically endangered or you know you can wait so that the areas of high abundance of those endangered species or, or high concern species have a higher weight than ones that are more abundant or, or not declining um and again not going to go into the statistical details here but um you can you can do this and, and this is what, are, what those results end up looking like this is for an analysis i did um, for the last implementation plan or the most recent implementation plan for the Prairie Habitat Joint Venture. And what we we're trying to do here uh, is identify priority areas for three different bird groups. And so first, um, just walk you through this. Uh, here, this, the colors represent relative priority, so blue being the lowest and red being the highest. Uh, up in the upper left, these are what we call upland-associated species, so land birds essentially. Um, in the lower left, those are wetland associated species. And it's important to note they're non-game wetland associated species. So this is things like grebes and coots, rails, you know, uh, red-winged blackbirds, things like that. Um, and oh, sorry, the upland species are primarily songbirds that inhabit the uplands. But there's also things like upland sandpiper in there too. So these are very much based on habitat associations. And then this mixed species, these are a small group of species that um, like both uplands and wetlands. And so these are your um, grassland song, or sorry, shorebirds. So um, marble godwit, long-billed curlew, and um, uh, willet. And so um, this is we did this to try and see how priority areas for these three species groups overlap with priority areas for waterfowl to see if you know how beneficial waterfowl conservation could be for other bird groups. And and this is just what we did. So you can see, you know, for the the upland species, the priority areas in red are really tightly close uh, associated with the grassland habitat for the most part. Um, whereas the wetland associated species are more the higher priority areas are further to the north and east, where we have much more large and permanent uh, water bodies, uh, which is what you'd expect. And then the mixed species is kind of a combination of the two. They they like they tend to like upland habitats that have a you know relatively high amount of wetlands intermixed with them. And then, so that's the, that shows you how you identify high priority areas based on where the species are most abundant. But you can also factor in other things as well. So, um, so up on the upper left, this is showing the relative priority of of uh, four um, grassland bird species of concern: uh, Baird sparrow, chestnut colored longspur, Sprague's pipit, and thick-billed longspur. Um, so those show you the high priority areas there. But again, this figure below, uh, the with the um, this is showing the grassland conversion risk that I showed you earlier. And so by combining those two models together, um, we can see which pixels are the highest priority from a bird abundance standpoint, but also the highest risk of being lost to cropland conversion. And that's what the black pixels in this map on the right represent, is those areas that are both a high risk and a high priority. So if, you know, that's one, one way of thinking about how we should strategize grassland conservation is focusing on these areas here first, because they're the ones we're most likely to lose. And the bird models, Show that they're, you know, even even though they're not necessarily in the core of the bird's population, you know, the losing them would still result in substantial population declines for the species. So yeah, those are just three main examples that I wanted to to provide uh, of, you know, applications of how we could use these species density models to help inform conservation. Um, just to conclude, um, you know, I, I currently have in hand models for about thirty species. Uh, primarily grassland bird species, but a few other non-grassland species as well. But the, what I'd like to point out is that we have enough data from those point counts that I showed you on the other map to produce models for about 300 species. And so those are the number of species that we have, you know, the minimum number of detections for from a statistical standpoint. So we can we can produce a model for them, but important note to make is that the predictive accuracy of these models is highly variable across species. And we do a cross-validation um, statistic to help um, uh, quantify how the, the predictive accuracy of these models and a lot of these grassland bird species that we have lots of detections for um, have very high accuracy um, and, and like the correlation coefficient so the the correlation between observed and and held back predicted data is like above 0.8 for a lot of these species but then a lot of those 300 species that we have enough data to, to build a model for you know some of them are going to be really poorly predicted like, or uh, have low accuracy so they're not all going to be as useful as the others so i just want to point that out and uh, so all these models, are, you know, my desire with me and my collaborators is to make them freely available to anyone who can make use of them. We don't have an efficient method of distributing these models at this time, but um, as we start ramping up production of more models, I hope to come up with a system uh, to help distribute them more efficiently just by downloading online. But right now, it's just, uh, 
you know, emailing me to, to ask me for, for what you're looking for, and I can help you out with that. Um, and yeah, to, to finish off, I just want to acknowledge, you know, four really important people who helped um, make my Canadian models, you know, turning them into a, a range-wide North American model a reality. So Dr. Chris Latimer and, and Dr. Ching Zhao from Bird Conservancy of the Rockies were really helpful in, in implementing the, the um, continent-wide models. Kevin Barnes from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Sarah Olam from World Wildlife Fund, they're both really instrumental in helping us uh, produce these um, spatial covariates that were needed uh, across the entire continent to, to make these models possible. Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Science Committee, they kind of were with me, uh, working with me right from the beginning when we started here in Canada. So uh, a lot of support from them. Of course, the Boreal Avian Modeling Project, who, who was the one who came up with, with these statistical techniques and refined them over the years. Um, and then the many, many data contributors that, that provided those hundreds of thousands of point counts uh, that we could use to make these models. And um, yeah, with that, I you know, we should have plenty of time for questions. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Robinson, for a great, great presentation. Yeah, well, with, with that, um, I, I think we should probably wrap up today. We've uh, definitely uh, asked a lot of questions of you and had a great presentation, so really appreciate that. Uh, I want to thank everyone else who uh, um, who joined our presentation today uh, or joined for the presentation today. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, our next seminar is going to be on Tuesday, March 26th, and we'll be hosting Dr. Andrea Brookfield from the University of Waterloo, uh, and she will be presenting on supporting sustainable water management decisions with science. Uh, so I hope folks can join us for that. Um, just as a quick reminder, if you're not on the emailing list to get regular updates of these se science seminars, please send an uh, email to the Office of the Chief Scientist. That's at ap.ocs. Uh, and that's at gov.ab.ca. Um, so yeah, with that, Dr. Robinson, I want to thank you once again for sharing such a, a great presentation and um, answering those questions. That's uh, really appreciated. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. And thanks for inviting me. Excellent. Thank you.